But I might ask the first question to Ian. Ian, when you um, proposed this development of the ICT strategy, what were the outcomes you were trying to achieve and have they met your expectation? Thanks, Chris. The, the broad outcome I wanted was a, a long-term uh, roadmap for how technology would serve Queensland Health. What we have uh, prior to, to this piece of work being done was uh, a path for contestability of services. We had a number of programs of work uh, underway. Uh, largely, those programs of work look like replacing uh, out-of-support legacy systems with, uh, with new whole-of-state uh, uh, solutions. And yet that wasn't the feedback that I was getting from hospital and health services in, in terms of what they were looking for. They're looking for a technology that's agile, that can be delivered quickly. If we have to phase it, that's fine. But the notion of a five-year program of work versus a six-month program of work uh, were, were uh, a fair way apart in terms of expectation. Uh, likewise, I wasn't seeing um, a, a sense of pace or recognition as to how quickly um, the technology industry was moving and how uh, we were able to actually take advantage of that. We always seem to be five to ten years behind uh, where the rest of industry was. And, and broadly, I think the, the roadmap that's, uh, that's been put forward that we've endorsed, uh, that we're now implementing, uh, I think has met the, uh, the expectations. Thank you, Ian. Um, the gentleman who had the question over there. So those, uh, I'm not quite sure how that uh, relates to technology, but I'm very happy to answer you that question. Answer, you were saying yep. that uh, no. Health will no longer own assets. What's going on? Sure. Maybe, 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 sell them? Sell the hospitals. maybe to uh, clarify, because I think you, um, you made a slight um, change of word there. Exactly Did what? Sure. Sure. What, what, I, what I did say was the Department of Health no longer owns assets. The assets are owned by our hospital and health services. Uh, the hospital and health services in a process, a gradual process of transition from the 1st of July, will have those assets moved across. Uh, they will maintain them. From my perspective, uh, having boards that comprise community members uh, that are commercial boards are going to be far better stewards of those assets and ensure that they're maintained to uh, commercial standards uh, into the future and make wise decisions about uh, future investments and new assets that are required. So that's the, that's the program of work that occurs from the 1st of July. I've been in the area for a long time, for quite some time. The Queensland government's wanting to close down the Merrill Hospital and put everything over to Harding Bay. I knew in Brisbane for a year and a half. Fantastic hospitals. But as you go beyond Brisbane, they're highly generic. My father-in-law has yes to travel back to Hanover. Close down hospitals. Okay. Well, look, the, the government hasn't closed down a hospital. There aren't plans to close down Mirabara Hospital. Um, I'm happy to talk to you afterwards about uh, other issues. I might actually ask the question then of Leslie Dwyer because Leslie is the chief executive of West Morton and she represents, um, I suppose, a hospital board and maybe that might be, a, you know. So Leslie, I suppose, direct question from you and leaning on from what David was asking, how will the new ICT strategic roadmap, roadmap enable you to improve patient services? Thanks, Chris. Um, I think throughout Ian's presentation, the word enabler was used many, many times. Um, you know, sort of, I'm a relative newbie to Queensland, so, um, you know, sort of, I've come from a different state about two years ago, and what I didn't see was a true enabler. The thing that I actually get out of bed and I worry about, keeps me awake at night, is actually about the care quality. So how do we know that we are providing the care that the community requires in the way that they expect? And what evidence do we have that that's exactly what we're doing? And currently, we don't have much in the way of technology that actually assists us to do that. Um, I'm really looking forward to when that I'm able to connect care. So, um, as Ian said, as a patient, as a family member of somebody that requires services, 
um, you don't expect to actually have to consider, am I talking to a private provider in the way of a GP? Now am I talking to something that is actually managed under the auspices of Queensland Health or the Hospital and Health Services? Now I've got an NGO. We have great difficulty in sharing information. And there's no reason why we can't, because it's not because we don't want to, it's actually because we find it hard. So I'm really looking forward to actually having a strategy that <coughs> recognises the core business of health, which is care, but also then thinks about the enablers. And I know, Chris, you haven't asked me this, but one thing that I, you know, in case I don't get asked another question, that I did want to say <laughs> was that, um, you know, sort of, don't... <laughs> Don't consider that, you know, sort of we are all experts in ICT. We all have our own view, and Ian said, you know, we all think about the things we do. I've discovered that as my children get into their 20s, I actually need to adopt some more children that are actually, you know, sort of at the beginning of their teenage years because I think that my own children are turning into Luddites and can't help their mother in the way that they could. But in fact, you know, what I'm looking forward to is actually that challenge and, you know, sort of, and that engagement very early on about what is the problem because the way that we actually go through what's the problem, what are we going to do about it, actually sets us up to be actually following by about a decade. And so I think that that's a really critical change. But at the base of that is being able to get visibility and connectivity to the care that we provide. This question over there. Um, Don Sands from Sinistra. I was just wondering if there's any thought around the performance metrics that you're going to be using for business case on the you've got you know, the level of care and the financial side. Is there any other performance metrics that you're going to be used to justify a business case? Well, I think that'll largely depend on on uh, what the what what the system uh, focuses on. So we have we have a clear range of metrics that define that we're doing a good job as a health system. Uh, the uh, time it takes to, to uh, have you seen an emergency department, the, the amount of time you wait on elective surgery waiting list. Um, uh, hopefully you leave the hospital without acquiring any new injuries or infections as a result of being there. So a range of patient quality, uh, access uh, and efficiency measures. And really we need to be able to link the benefits that technology um, delivers back to those core KPIs. So if it's not possible to determine how uh, an IT intervention uh, assists us in addressing the, the 10 or 15 key performance indicators of our business, then I'd suggest it's going to be a struggle to get a business case up. Any other questions? Sorry. Chris, are you? Uh, I'm quickly with what, uh, a view from yourself, Leslie, as well as generally from the panel. Uh, IT projects in healthcare internationally are kind of run down as being uh, uh, a quite complex and something to do with the living. Um, there's certainly been a lot of experiences in Australia with projects that have started out with great plans, good visions, and the execution has let them down. What's the plan in terms of having access to skills across the state um, to deliver some of these projects, both from the clinical side having to provide input and from the IT side? Um, because in, in my time uh, working around Queensland, I see a like, heavy emphasis on people with the process of project management discipline and not necessarily on the SMEs who have the experience and successfully with Okay. Um, well, I'll start, as though you asked me to. Um, and in fact, I think you could be describing a couple of the states that I've worked in. Um, so, um, you know, so, and you're right, as in, you know, I've worked in health over 30 years and I've really struggled to think about when I've actually seen something, you know, a large scale project actually complete because most of us move on in the meantime and, and I think that's always a risk with, you know, big programs that in fact, you know, sort of how do you maintain the capability and um, I suppose the memory about what you were doing. Um, I suppose my lesson in that has been a little bit around you know, um, if in fact, you know, everybody's going to lose the will to live during the length of that project, you know, is it really meeting its needs? So, um, you know, sort of, I think that, um, you know, sort of from the health, from my health service perspective, getting in, um, I call them the smart friends, is really critical to the business, and I alluded to that in the way I answered the last question, is that in fact, we do need to reach out, we do need to go and have a look at best of breed, but we also need to adapt that to our own lo local circumstances and to be able to prioritise. Um, I'm in a health service that um, I think Ray and others, um, in fact I know who it was because he's in the room, described as a lost world um, from an ICT perspective. 
So I don't want to have, you know, sort of an evolutionary change because by the time we get there, we have actually still maintained being about a decade behind what we do. So I'm really looking for, in anything we do going forward, being challenged, being, you know, having the smarts and at least landing in a spot or understanding what the journey is to get there that is going to future-proof the organisation. We need to be able to continue to build foundation upon foundation and at times be brave, take that big leap. You know, sort of we often talk within the organisation that I work with that we don't want to be risk averse. We certainly want to be risk aware. We will not be foolhardy. But at times, and you see it even within the public service values, you know, be courageous. Um, and um, perhaps it will be courageous for the first person that is. Um, question over there. Uh, sorry, Mark Edmund from Efficiency Leaders. Uh, given some of the commentary, uh, Mr Maynard, about uh, industry engagement, and bringing that earlier on, I was wondering whether the panel might like to expand on what changes are going to occur in terms of inviting industry engagement, the mechanisms, who's going to be doing it, will it be centrally managed, etc. Well, the, the decision on how uh, industry engagement will occur, occurs will largely rest with the uh, with the executive sponsor of. Uh, the, the, the program of work and I indicated in my early remarks that that will be uh, the, a, a business, uh, potentially a hospital and health service chief executive, potentially a clinician, a deputy director general. So they'll determine how industry engagement occurs. Uh, we have a contestability model uh, within government that we've, uh, we've been applying for the last 12 months. Uh, that contestability model has active industry engagement at all stages through the process. Um, and it's that model that will be applied in terms of how, how, we, uh, how we engage. And that can present some probity uh, challenges um, and quite often probity is thrown up as a reason why we shouldn't be engaging and why engagement only occurs when a tender hits the market. Um, that is not um, current mature thinking in terms of strategic sourcing. Uh, it's, it's not difficult to have clear probity plans in place uh, managed, well managed, uh, open to all industry engagement and a far better, more informed tender as a result at the end of the process. Okay. Gentleman over there. Thank you. Uh, that was my question as well. How do, <laughs> how do we engage? We hear about enablement. Um, who do we talk to? I might briefly also answer that question. After this um, slide, we'll also give you a contact details in relation to um, after this particular forum and what we are going to do also is also, um, and I'll pass it on to you in a second, develop an industry engagement model and make that very transparent for you so that you know exactly where to come to. Ian, did you have anything else to add? Once again, I think the, the, the person will depend on the program of work and the choice uh, of the executive sponsor as to how engagement will occur, but broadly based within, uh, within the Queensland Government's contestability framework. Mm. I might ask another question, and this time to, um, to Andrew, whilst we're getting the next question. In relation to the whole of government, ICT strategy for government, I suppose, Andrew, how does Queensland Health align to that larger strategy? Um, well, it's a third of government, so it's pretty important that we actually work with health uh, in that sense. So um, I've been working with health, uh, and again, uh, two of us fairly new here, since I've got here. Um, and in some senses, uh, my minister, when I first arrived, gave one of my KPIs, as I'll tell Chris this morning, if you health, help health, you've done your job. So in some senses, um, Ian heard that one of my first meetings. So but it's about involvement. It's in, in a sense, we're the same as the central health are supporting uh, hospital and health services. The central government has changed its approach as well. We're here to support the agencies to deliver, not to direct how they deliver. So really important that we get on that side. And I suppose a key example of that is uh, my team support uh, what's called the DG Council, which is actually a group of director generals who are there to uh, advise my minister uh, when he's going to CPRC to support or not support uh, agency uh, submissions. So it's actually not the centre making those decisions, it's a group of DGs who are making that, and it's, that's a really important change in what's happened in the last 12 months. So, in a sense, it's layer upon layer. What Central Health's doing with their facilities is Central Government is doing with health. Thanks, Andrew. 
G'day, Sam Higgins from Business Aspect. Um, this is one for Leslie and Ray. Is there, has there been any examples of delivering against the roadmap and some of the vision that Ian outlined? Is there any case studies you can talk to or test projects that have been successful? Just some examples, and if not, maybe an example of one that you've been starting the process on that you could share with us, just to illustrate, I suppose, on the ground what Ian described. Uh, thanks, Sam. Um, I, I guess a, an, an example is the bundle strategy that we've, we've been uh, progressing uh, so far today. Um, we're actually going through a process where we're actually looking at that bundle strategy and aligning and ensuring an alignment to that uh, against the roadmap. Uh, that'll include ensuring that the, the, those bundles align to uh, the benefit statements, the, the, the business ownership of those as we go through the process. So that's the, I guess, all of, the, all of our key initiatives are actually going to go through that. Um, so the bundles and IMR are actually all being assessed to ensure that the, the, the appropriate level of, of HHS ownership, participation, um, uh, is included in, in the overall uh, um, delivery of those initiatives. Um, and that um, the benefits that we expect are actually clearly articulated and are able to be, uh, to, to be uh, harvested. Um, I might just add to that. Um, Ian said in his presentation that it is actually not the intent for, you know, sort of Queensland Health to go to a 16 ways of doing the same thing. And it is really important that um, some of the things that Ray's just described actually bring benefit to all of us. And, um, you know, sort of, we certainly, you know, sort of West Morton is just in the western suburbs heading out through Ipswich, you know, sort of, we look at some of our bigger, you know, sort of um, colleagues, um, bigger in, as in size, and um, understand that at times that it's going to be really important for us to keep close to them. Um, but some of these, you know, sort of early projects, I think are giving us a different way of working together and, um, you know, sort of a different way of actually seeing, you know, what is possible. So although the intent isn't to do it 16 times, um, and my guess is we're pretty much aligned in what most of us actually want out of our ICT, it will just be the scale of which we do it and where we're able to pop in and out and say, actually, that's something we're interested in, so we want to be involved in that. We're, wait you know, we're happy to be what I'll call fast followers on something else because we don't have all of the building blocks in place, but we need to do that while perhaps somebody else is being the leader. Okay. A question over there. Uh, just before I heard the uh, comments around contestability, I was just wondering whether the cost of contestability versus the risk and the assessment, is that going to be put out to the market so that we can actually view what that contestability was and how we can actually step ourselves into the future when we look at an environment for the last 10 years, you say that we're behind, what is the change from the upper boards to this contestability to make it change tomorrow? I'm, I'm not sure that the change is going to happen quickly, so I'm, I'm not expecting a, 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 a turnaround uh, overnight. Um, contestability uh, is about I engaging with you. If we don't engage uh, with the industry, then you don't get the signals about what's working well, what innovations are adding value, uh, where your cost is out of the market, where your value proposition doesn't hit the, hit the mark, uh, where the standards are set too high or too low. So unless we engage with you, um, it's a hit and miss process. And that's the downside of the tender process that governments traditionally operate. Uh, you, you get one shot at responding, you're successful or not, you, you, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's a shot in the dark. Contestability is only effective if there's that, um, that active uh, and, and regular engagement. I think you should expect us to be fairly clear and transparent around um, what, what our expectations are in terms of cost, giving you signals, being clear about the standards where we have standards and where we don't, being clear that we're expecting you to, uh, to innovate. As I'm sure most in this room would probably agree, uh, you actually hit on one of the biggest points or biggest issues that we can see within uh, Queensland Health at the moment. Contestability is not going to happen by tomorrow. The biggest issue within Queensland Health at the moment is the time it takes to get a decision to get to market and to get out of that market and be able to deliver. Quite often when we get to deliver, the technology that we're putting in is two years old. Yep, agreed. Look, the, that's, a, that's a challenge. Uh, I think we've been very successful in the last two years in moving from a highly centralised system where the department called all the shots, made the decisions, directed the way healthcare was delivered, uh, to uh, a system now that 
devolves that responsibility and decision making to hospital and health services. Uh, that's led, led to much faster turnarounds. Um, in, in the last 12 months alone, we've delivered, um, we're on track to deliver um, a, a, a significant surplus that will be reinvested in additional services for patients. We've been the best improver uh, across all of the states in terms of our access to emergency departments. We have the lowest median waiting time for elective surgery. Now, when I talk to my colleagues down south, they think it's impossible. They're still looking at deficits and declining performance improvements. Now, that's only been possible because we operate in a devolved system where hospital and health services are actually able to get on and, and, and do the job. The challenge is how we translate um, technology decisions and ICT investments into that same environment. And I'm convinced we will get much better, more effective decision making uh, when uh, there is greater accountability for the HHSs as to how they spend their ICT dollars. That, that ICT budget is still centralised and delivered on behalf of HHSs. We need to move quickly to an environment where they control the budget and they make the decisions around how that budget's invested. Um, Mike Stoutman, um, one question about, you talked about a, an advisory board. Um, I'm assuming that was an information advisory board. I was interested in the makeup and how that's going to operate. Mike, that, uh, that advisory uh, board is still being um, uh, put, put together. It will be very much a, uh, a, a technology focus. Uh, it won't have a role in terms of um, governing the, the delivery of programs of work. Uh, it will be there to advise uh, myself and the Minister in terms of how technology can support and enable uh, the system. It'll have, uh, it'll have a, a mixture of uh, people from uh, Andrew Mills representing whole of government uh, through to uh, private sector non-health uh, technology experts, private sector health technology experts uh, and hospital and health service chief executives. So it's focused on those who are the, the, the customer of those services at the moment, uh, the HHSs, and those in the market who are considered as being you know, leading practitioners in terms of how they have delivered technology to facilitate improvement in their businesses. I'm not sure if someone from the, 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 the federal government um, is, is required, but certainly as we've looked to uh, put forward um, the composition of that, that board, we're looking at, at national uh, leaders in terms of deploying technology in their organisations. Any other questions? Might have a quick one for Ray. Um, Ray. Just in relation to the ICT strategic roadmap, as, you, as you're going to be the owner of delivering these, uh, this strategic roadmap, what are, the, what are your priorities and what will you be focused on? Uh, thanks, Chris. So in, in the role of, of the CTO, I guess, I, I see my role predominantly around ensuring that the existing investments, and then as, as everybody in this room knows, I mean, over the last 20 odd years, health has invested significantly in a whole range of ICT infrastructure. And today provides a whole range of services to, to to support frontline uh, health service delivery. Um, while we're going through this transitional process, it's really, really important, I think, that we ensure that those services are continued and that they are operating at, a, at the level of quality that they're currently operating, if not uh, improved. Um, and then the challenge is, how do we actually then transition these services into more modern service delivery um, um, options, and particularly as it relates to application space? Um, and, and also, um, I guess, um, transition the organisation into being able to support um, uh, the new, new service delivery models. I think our focus will be around uh, ensuring that that occurs, that that transition is successful um, and, and, and I guess moving the whole model away from you know, running big projects to actually onboarding people onto services that already exist and are commercially available. So our skill set is going to need to move, I think, significantly to to onboarding uh, type skill sets rather than um, big project management skill sets, although we're still going to need, obviously, to run, run projects to actually do that. Thanks, Ray. Not seeing any other eager hands up there. Oh, eager hand. Gentleman over there. Thank you. 
Oh, can I ask a question? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Dwight Walker. I'm a uh, librarian, and uh, I'm interested in the metadata. You talk about standards. We want to compare apples with apples. The department might have one standard, like is it a health standard in the federal government? You know, health standards, like in terms of uh, morbidity or, or technology. You know what I mean? We need to be know where we're coming from here, because it's like you're up in the gods. And you had these 20 year long delays, or 10 year long delays, like the Department of Defense used to. So where, where is your metadata standards here? In terms of uh, what you define as your cloud, what you define as your desktop, that sort of thing. So we then know how, and how many are there you need. Quantities, that sort of thing. We need to know scope. So I might, uh, I might give a layman's answer to that and then hand over to, uh, to, to Ray to um, uh, address it more specifically. From my perspective, um, our needs are, are pretty straightforward. We need access to patient data, uh, and that's, that's clinical records, diagnostic path, uh, you know, pathology uh, test results, uh, ultimately GP and allied health professional data. We need access to that anywhere in the system. Any health professional that's seeing that patient needs access to it. And that's really um, as, as prescribed as we, we would need to be. Um, our default way of achieving that in the past has probably been through having whole of system, a whole of state uh, systems that, that embed uh, that standard. We need to be much clearer in the signals we give to, to industry around what that standard is. But that's the expectation. Uh, it's no more complicated than that. Uh, I don't really care as a, as a system manager whether West Morton does that using a different patient administration system from the rest of Queensland Health. The only key criteria is that the data relating to the patient is accessible anywhere in the system. Thank you. Um, just to add to that, and I'm happy to talk to you in more detail afterwards if, if, if you want to make contact with me. But I, but I guess, I guess we've, we've, we've done some work uh, significantly, I guess, over that in the, in the last little while, and we'll continue to do so. But it's really focused, I guess, around the areas where current investments are occurring, and certainly um, working at the national level with, uh, in terms of the national e-health strategy, and starting to find some of these um, standards and, and, and metadata standards and so on around key uh, information areas that are being f you know, looked at at a national level is really where a lot of the focus has been. As you know, we could spend a lot of time and effort going right across the full uh, spectrum of health. Um, and uh, you know, so we, I guess we really need to focus it around where the investments are actually going to lie uh, over the next couple of years. But I'm happy to talk to you in a bit more detail later if you wish. Can I, so you're going to use the uh, PC EHR personal, you know, to integrate with the federal uh, health uh, records? Is it? But well, we've been um, working significantly over the last couple of years with NETA and uh, around that whole national e-health agenda. Um, so from a Queensland perspective, we are already following the, the standards uh, that NETA have, devo have um, developed, particularly as it relates to uh, things like discharge summaries and those sorts of things, where we're already sending to the, the PCHR from uh, all Queensland health facilities discharge summaries that conform to that, that national standard. Um, and we're consuming that as well. So right across Queensland, we can actually view that. Any clinician can see that information from any Queensland health facility. So that, that's an example. And there's going to be further work, particularly around um, pathology and, 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 and other diagnostic imaging uh, areas that will uh, uh, pick up a bit of focus over the next 12 months or so. OK, thank you. Yeah, Robert Zanian from CDN. Uh, that was going to be my question as well about um, there hasn't been any reference to the PCEHR project where the federal government's going to invest $143 million to that project this year. Um, oh, you know, we're just worried in the um, ICT industry about overlap, uh, duplication and non-standards around the country where you know, there's still not an implementation of a single patient UID um, available to the public or the hospitals in any state. Uh, each state's doing their own thing. And also, is there any discussion between the state um, health uh, departments about um, failures of projects that you might be already considering and success of other projects in the states? Um, yeah, so just wondering about standardization. Uh, 
There, there has been a lot of discussion uh, between the states around standardisation, ensuring that um, we're not reinventing the wheel. Um, and, and each state, I think, has taken a, a more proactive uh, or have taken a proactive position in terms of developing aspects of, you know, the national e-health uh, strategy uh, that become the pilots for, uh, for other states. Uh, the $143 million that's been committed by the Commonwealth Government in its recent budget announcement really just keeps the lights on uh, for the National E-Health Transition Authority. Um, the, the challenge will be uh, looking at prioritising wh where future investments are made. Uh, that organisation is jointly owned by the states. It's not a function of, uh, of the Commonwealth. Um, uh, we certainly see that it will have a, an ongoing role because it is a critical um, vehicle to ensure that we get standardisation. Uh, I am hopeful that by the end of this year the Commonwealth will uh, make a decision to have uh, the uh, PCEHR as an opt-out uh, process. At the moment, despite uh, fantastic efforts by the Commonwealth to get patient uptake, we still have less than 8% of the community that has a, a personally controlled health record. Until we get to 98%, uh, we're going to struggle to get take up by GPs, allied health professionals. <coughs> so all the efforts that, that we undertake in terms of discharge summaries into the PCEHR, um, that has relatively limited value unless um, GPs and allied health professionals are taking advantage of that. Um, and certainly there's, there's only 8% of the community that have uh, have a record at this point. David. Oh, yep, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. sorry, Deborah Kratzer with HP. Uh, Mr Maynard, earlier you mentioned the first couple of bundles and you're looking to aggressively get those to market and then you talked about trying to get alignment with the business cases and KPIs. Just wondered if you're able to give us any advice on, I guess, the time, where that sits in the process when we could expect to see something to market and will there be sort of advance notice given in terms of, of that coming out so that the industry can be prepared? Okay, we, we, uh, we are still going through the, the approvals uh, process to uh, get the green light for that to, to go to market. So it's a little difficult as at today to, to have a uh, specific time. Uh, but the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the OI uh, document, the approach, uh, which builds on the early market engagement uh, is completed uh, and once that approvals process is, um, is uh, concluded uh, we'll be in a position to advise the market and give you a clear indication as to uh, the date when it comes out. I think we're talking, we're, we're talking in the vicinity of two, uh, maybe three months, that sort of time frame. Just for the two gentlemen before, in the, uh, in the recommendations of the ICT strategic framework, there's also going to be a governance board around um, information standards and architecture, uh, which will obviously take into consideration a whole number of standards, both in the current jurisdiction and also uh, national standards. So just so that you're aware, you'll see that online when you have a look at the, the actual strategic roadmap. David. David Graham Parker, I'm the IT specialist, like 18 years mm -hmm. or so. I'm one of the 8% who have actually got an e-record, it's brilliant. <laughs> Guys, why aren't you working with the government to put it all under here? Because when I'm transferred to Sydney to work or whatever, wouldn't it be great just to transfer my, or have access to my files? I think it's a big mistake that you're actually centralising just in Queensland. The uptake from people I've spoken with, I've worked with um, Centre Care on the Fraser Coast, working with that system, people are afraid afraid to hand over this information. They're afraid of what you know, the government's doing already. It's a hard sell. Why don't you just say, look, as a government, let's move towards, maybe under the Australia card that no one, didn't, no one wanted under Bob Hawke, maybe it's time. Look, the, the decision around a, a, a health, a unique health uh, individual identifier sits with the Commonwealth. And we've, we've been lobbying them hard about, you know, being clear on how that will move uh, forward. Uh, the good news is that the personally controlled e-health record is accessible anywhere uh, in Australia. So if you move to Sydney, uh, your, any, any data that's on your PCEHR uh, from uh, any engagements you've had in Queensland will be, will be viewable in New South Wales. The, the, the challenge is whether the GP has actually um, uh, taken that up and whether the GP wants to engage. So there's a, there, there are layers of... Um, of sort of barrier in the way. One, having a, an opt-in system which has meant 
um, despite all the best endeavours, we only have 1.6 million Australians who've opted in. The second is having hospitals able to uh, uh, put information into it, to have GPs and allied health practitioners to be able to put information in. So you've got a complete uh, patient uh, data file. And then the third is the uptake of GPs and allied health professionals. And that uptake nationally has been um, well below what, uh, what's been expected. What, 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 what we're doing is ensuring that um, barrier one is removed. So that in terms of any data that relates to a patient uh, that's generated by Queensland Health, it's able to be um, transferred to your personal health record. Uh, we're also working, uh, and we've got a number of uh, trials underway in the state, uh, one in Metro North, one in uh, Cape York, looking at how we can engage uh, in an integrated way with general practitioners and through that process uh, in, improve their uptake, their knowledge of the benefit of a personally controlled health record uh, and ultimately get uh, a much greater uptake in the GP community. But I'll... Well, we... We can do our bit in the state and through NITA and our relationship with the Commonwealth, we can lobby them uh, to continue to invest and put effort into general practice and primary health care, which is really not, it's not the responsibility of state governments, that sits with the Commonwealth. So we're, we're working hard and lobbying hard in that area as well. Gentleman here, thank you. It's uh, Robert Zania from CDN. Um, just another issue, um, while attending HIMSS conferences and all around Australia, the common complaint and um, legacy of the health departments is that we're all behind five, ten years in technology. And that's because our operating systems and our SOEs are uh, limited by legacy applications. Is there going to be some sort of standard um, put in place to uh, monitor or assess the vendors that you choose for ICT projects on their ability to move with the times and be agile. Um, there's never any focus on the vendors you choose and mainly the international ones that are, that are just restricted on old technologies that hold your technology, your operating systems to IE6 XP and all of these old operating systems. So in all the meetings and discussions we go to, there's never any discussion about standardising the vendor that you choose to be agile enough. Um, I'll, I'll kick off. Uh, and then others, Andrew and, and Ian may wish to comment as well. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely, absolutely right. And, and, and Ian mentioned this uh, earlier in terms of the difficulty to actually, for a health department to actually migrate off a really old desktop onto a more modern desktop. Um, the, the biggest issue isn't the ability to, to, to deploy PCs with the latest operating system. It's actually um, the, the legacy applications that are being run within the facilities across the state. And there's thousands of these things. And, and, we, and part of the process is about remediating a lot of these or turning them off. So that's, that's the legacy environment, and that's the stuff we, we have to work in today. But the future is going to be less dependent, I hope, on those, on those legacy application models and, and much more um, being provided as a service from vendors out there, where we don't become dependent on, on in-house uh, constraints ab about um, you know, being able to access and utilise these, these sorts of application deliveries. And the, infam and, the, and the focus has to be much more around the data standards so that we can ensure that the data is accessible regardless of what application um, clinicians want to use. I mean, uh, we we're, were involved in some discussions recently and, you know, there's thousands of mobile apps on, on phones that, that are available in the health sector and we really need to be saying, well, use whatever application you really want if you want to access the data uh, remotely. But the application just has to be able to meet particular access, you know, particular standards in terms of um, accessing and displaying information in an appropriate way. And we need to focus more around that end rather than the application. We've got um, opportunity for two more questions. I've got a gentleman over there and then got the last one over there. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Glenn Steele from Dell. Um, quick question, probably for Ian. Um, as we go into the world of contestability and as a service, we're going to come into a much different commercial construct than we have today. Can we get some guidance as to what the commercial reality might be when we actually look to connect with Queensland Health and more importantly, or as importantly, 
um, is there a change to the GITC that we can expect shortly? I might uh, leave it to Andrew to talk about uh, GITC. Sorry, Andrew, not Ian. I think um, in, in, terms of, uh, in, in terms of commercial uh, relationships, if, uh, if the tender processes cost you uh, significant dollars and you don't get feedback, then that's got to change because ultimately it'll result in two things. You, you'll just you'll, you'll grow tired of, of uh, um, you know, responding to tenders or, or engaging with Queensland Health and we end up with a less contestable environment or that's loaded into your pricing, that, that high cost of doing business with us. Uh, we need to be much uh, more streamlined and focus on, on where value is added. Um, we, you know, I mean, we focus, we, we, we've made some good progress, I think, in the area of social services in the last uh, 12 months across government, moving to one <coughs> common uh, boilerplate uh, contract, a short form tender process. So if you provide social services to government, it's now much faster, uh, it's much more efficient, regardless of whether you're providing that to Queensland Health, Department of Communities, Department of Corrections, it's the same contract term. Now that's, feedback I get is that's a big step forward. Uh, industry see that as being very, very positive. How that translates into the IT environment, I'm, I'm not quite uh, sure, but I get the same feedback from any vendors that work uh, with us. Any of our key partners say, you're a high cost to do business with, you don't engage, you don't communicate effectively. Uh, and, and that translates into cost and inefficiency for, uh, for the supplier's business. Um, we're really getting into a whole new broad topic because actually, as well as an ICT reform, there's also procurement reform going on. So, uh, in a sense, uh, that could be an <laughs> we'd, we'd take it at the same time as here. Um, GITC is already being modified uh, to meet as a service, and we have, I think, and I'll, I'll get told if I'm wrong, I think it's Schedule 10 being modified right now. Oh, I'm getting nods, that's good. Um, but also a strong recognition that the way we've done business in the last 30 years is not the way we can do business in the next 30. Um, we're heading, by heading to cloud and as a service, the days of government signing big amorphous contracts are probably limited. Yes, they will be used in some areas, but more and more we'll need to work our way through. An app developer is not going to sign a GITC contract with us. Um, so the recognition, we're going through a whole heap of procurement reform. Uh, there will be a lead, category lead on ICT, which is, um, actually developing up and it's, it's within Decidia and um, I'm sure if you go to another pit briefing they'll be happy to talk about these issues uh, in detail. So it, supporting and changing gradually, uh, we can't change it all today but we're certainly recognising that and the rules around procurement are changing and I'll use one example, the innovation, half a million dollar with SME innovation capability is there. The policies change, yes we're starting to see it hasn't changed fully with everybody in eight governments, but we are working with all agencies for them to start using that facility to get a bit more agility, and certainly we would see HHSs and people like that using that capability much more. Thank you. Um, and last question. Yeah, thanks. I think uh, that last piece actually answered my final question. Not quite the way I expected, but it's still an answer. Um, so if I may, can I just add maybe two observations? One is that at first blush this morning, it seems that potentially um, health might actually become more difficult to engage with, but um, hopefully that's not going to be the case. Um, and secondly, uh, it sounds like you're also about to embark on one heck of an integration project, so good luck. 